the Presidential Advisory Committee Against Corruption Parker certainly deserves a commendation, not just for their sterling and innovative contributions in the fight against corruption, but for regularly setting the agenda for important conversations on the subject. This meeting, which is called to discuss a collaborative approach to eradicating the evils of corruption, is notably one of such. For years, corruption has been by far Nigeria's most devastating problem. A recent PricewaterhouseCoopers study titled The Impact of Corruption on the Nigerian Economy made the following general findings and conclusions on the effects of corruption. One, that corruption has a dynamic impact which is felt more by poorer households and smaller companies. Secondly, that Corruption, countries with higher corruption are associated with lower tax revenues and lower expenditures as a percentage of GDP in the most important indicators of human development, namely health and education. Corruption is also associated, they say, with the erosion of talent in public institutions and therefore government's effectiveness is eroded. For they say corruption usually needs the creation of unnecessary bureaucracy to enable further opportunities for bribes. This means that the enforcement of contracts, of property rights, etc., are hindered and are weakened by corruption. Five, that corruption is associated with lower investment, higher prices, and barriers to entry for business. Six, that corruption is associated with lower average standard of living lower education levels, and greater inequality in society. But their final conclusion is that Nigeria's 2030 GDP can be up by at least 534 billion US dollars if we reduce corruption. And they say that if we reduce corruption by about 20%, we can actually have that level of higher GDP. So really, it doesn't matter how much uh, revenue a country makes or how transformative its plans are. If it allows corruption to thrive, this will ensure that the majority of people do not benefit from all of the revenues or all of the, whatever it is that the country is able to produce, or simply truncate the plans of the nation. Which is why, despite the highest oil revenues in our history, between the period 2010 to 2014, debt doubled and poverty figures also rose. It is for these reasons that President Muhammad Buhari famously warned that if we don't kill corruption, corruption will kill us. Which is why a major pillar of our government's socioeconomic agenda is the fight against corruption. And which is why perhaps one of the first bodies to be set up in 2015 by the president was Packard. And since 2015, much has been done in this battle against corruption. But we're not even slightly deluded into thinking that we have won the battle, or that we're even close. Certainly not. We're still very far, and we're still much far, but we, but we must admit that we are much farther, we're much farther, we're much farther, or much closer to finding a solution than when we first began. Our policy was to tackle anti-corruption, grand corruption, beg your pardon, first. That was our policy, to deal with grand corruption first. By this I mean the stealing of huge public resources directly from the Treasury, usually at the behest of the highest levels of executive authority, and the stealing of budgeted funds through various schemes. How did we go about this? The enforcement first of TSA, the Presidential Initiative on Continuous Audit, and even ensuring that most civil servants are on the IP's electronic platform, which simply is a way of ensuring that there are no ghost workers. By putting all public officials, including, uh, including those in the armed forces and police, on our electronic platform, on our electronic payment platform, so that all of our human resources are accounted for electronically. This has greatly helped to reducing 
uh, the number of growth blockers and the corruption that thrives on account of that huge number. The judiciary also moved the needle in recent times. Supreme Court, in a lead judgment of Alcas GSC, recently held that forfeiture under Section 17 of the Advanced Fee Fraud and Other Related Offenses Act is a civil matter. So it neither requires the criminal conviction of the property owner nor his innocence. This opens the door for forfeiture of assets that the purported owner cannot explain whether or not there is an allegation of corruption. We are now poised to deal with the wider problems of systemic corruption, especially where the average person interacts with government. It is that level of corruption that affects our people the most, where the average person is doing some business or is seeking some, some favor or some discretion from government. Corruption, for example, in the issuance of contracts, licenses, and other government approvals, there is no reason why any Nigerian should have to pay bribes to law enforcement agencies or agents for obtaining driver's licenses or passports or to clear goods at our ports. All the relevant government agencies have shown a serious commitment to eradicating corruption at various, at all of our meetings, especially the meetings, uh, the interagency meetings. Our next level is to create the environment for collaboration between our agencies civil society and other stakeholders. But the most enduring solutions to ending corruption are those that take into account the fact that the most potent weapon that corruption has is its acceptance as the norm in any society. The situation where even the natural custodians of societal morality and values acquiesce in it. A situation where, in particular, religious pulpits are silent about it. An enemy that is configured in such complexity cannot be defeated by solely a law and order approach. It requires a whole new national and individual reorientation, a focus on attitudinal change. It must involve the collaboration of government, civil society, especially the leadership of our faith communities, schools, and professional and other interest groups. This is why this meeting's objectives are very important indeed. Finally, let me again congratulate PACA on their landmark achievements in the past four years. Establishing PACA was the first major action that President Muhammad Buhari took in the anti-corruption fight. Since then, under the courageous and uncompromising leadership of one of the enduring figures in the legal profession and civil society, Professor Ishe Sagi, the PACAC has moved from strength to strength. Professor Sagi's interventions on various critical issues of governance, the rule of law, and corruption have, have definitely, definitely pointed our opinion in the morally and legally just direction. We must also congratulate PACAC on the recent Senate confirmation of your former Executive Secretary, Professor Bolaji Owasson, as Chairman of the, of the uh, ICPC. Our struggle against corruption is one for the soul and substance of our nation. The battle must be a collective one. Corruption fights back with venom, with guile, and with force. It is relentless and unashamed. We who fight it must meet it with greater resolve and greater commitment. We can only win by working together with a common vision. Well, thank you for listening. It is now my very special pleasure and privilege to formally declare this meeting open. Thank you.